Good morning. My name is uh, Gavin uh, Giovanoni. I'm the neurologist at Barts and London School of Medicine and Dentistry, and I'm going to just do a short um, video talk on the future of MS therapy. I gave a talk uh, on this topic uh, in Germany uh, at the end of last week, and I thought it would be quite appropriate for me to uh, do it for the subscribers of MS Selfie. Just to remind you, I do have a large uh, number of disclosures simply because I'm an academic working in multiple sclerosis and one of the only ways we can develop new treatments is by uh, pharmaceutical industry and I do sit on a large number of steering committees, advisory boards and I interact with the pharmaceutical industry um, continuously really around drug development in MS. So I started off by talking about the black swan. This is actually a concept that was put forward by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. Uh, he's a very well-known writer now. He actually is a st statistician mathematician, and he used to walk on, work on Wall Street, mainly do dealing with uh, financial derivatives, uh, discussing risks and what happens to risks. And this particular book uh, is about the fact that improbable things actually happen more often than we realize. Uh, and uh, he calls those black swan events. So when things happen in a field that are completely out of unexpected or come from outside, uh, he refers to them as a black swan. And I do think there's a black swan. And I actually feel that we now are pretty sure that Epstein-Barr virus is the cause of multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> uh, just to remind you that it is necessary to have the virus to get MS. It's not sufficient, though. In other words, you need other risk factors and possibly bad luck to get multiple sclerosis. But the underlying principle is if we stop you getting EBV, uh, we could prevent you getting multiple sclerosis. And that's the underlying principle uh, driving the so-called vaccine primary prevention program. In other words, if we vaccinate the population against Epstein-Barr virus, prevent them getting infected with the virus, we may be able to prevent multiple sclerosis. Now, that doesn't deal with the question about what happens if you have the virus in yourself. Uh, and there are two leading hypotheses. The one is the so-called hit-and-run hypothesis. So Epstein-Barr virus triggers the onset of MS very early on. And then regardless of what happens to the virus, you've got the disease. And even if you target the virus, you don't target MS. I don't subscribe to that. I subscribe to the so-called driver or cog hypothesis. And that is that Epstein-Barr virus uh, it's a herpes virus and it remains latent uh, in our bodies. It never goes away and it actually cycles through the so-called latency and lytic infection continuously. And I think it's this latent lytic uh, cycling that is driving the, the disease. And if we can stop the virus from cycling through the uh, lytic phase, we may be able to stop MS. Now, how this causes MS, I don't know. We've got quite a few hypotheses. One is it may be driving autoimmunity. Every time the virus reactivates, it drives autoimmunity. <clears throat> or the other thing is the virus actually is the disease in that it's infecting the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord. And when it reactivates, the immune system finds it and cause, causes the damage. Despite this now, we have an hypothesis that needs testing. And this means we should be targeting this virus in different ways. And so I think the real uh, future of MS is how do we target uh, EBV uh, to treat the disease. I wanted to point out that um, my colleague David Baker and our group published this paper now almost five years ago, where we actually analyzed the impact of all our therapies on the cell where Epstein-Barr virus lives, you know, where it lies dormant. It actually remains in the so-called memory B cell. And all of our therapies uh, either decrease memory B cells or stop them trafficking into the brain. The, the trafficking is natalizumab or Tysabri that blocks the trafficking of these cells into the brain. So, and there is one exception. The one exception is teriflunamide. Uh, teriflunamide or Baggio does not affect memory B cell numbers. Now, teriflunamide is an outlier in a whole lot of ways. It seems to have an impact uh, on MS. Uh, in terms of brain volume loss and disability that's out of proportion to its impact on relapses and MRI activity. And it seems to work as a therapy when it's given second, third or fourth line much better than when it's given as a first line therapy. 
and we think that teriflunamide may be working as antiviral. It has pan antiviral effects. So the fact that uh, teriflunamide is an outlier might indicate that it's working in a different way. Now I've highlighted in this red box two drugs. Uh, one is called the Tassicept, uh, the other one's called infliximab, which is an anti-TNF. A Tassicept blocks uh, the survival factors for B cells. And both these agents were shown to actually not work in MS, they actually increase disease activity in MS. And interestingly enough, they actually increase memory B cells in the peripheral blood. So yeah, we have the corollary. If you increase memory B cells, what happens? And we've got two experiments that have happened in MS um, of two drugs that didn't work. And these two drugs actually increased MS disease activity. And both of these drugs increased memory B. So we've got this circumstantial evidence um, <clears throat> that the memory B cell may be the pivotal cell in terms of driving MS disease activity. And we think it's Epstein-Barr virus that resides in that cell. Now, you may or may not know that people who are on anti-trafficking therapies like nadaluzumab or fingolimod or the fingolimod-like agents, and this blocks trafficking of cells, they do very well. But when you remove the drug and allow it to wash out, they get the so-called rebound activity, where they get a florid uh, um, gadolinium-enhancing lesions and relapses. It doesn't happen in every person, but it happens in around 40 to 50% of people when you actually look for this particular phenomenon in the window when the drug is washed out. And this can be quite uh, serious, um, and we've had a few deaths. And what's interesting is that two patients that have died of gadolinium rebound came to post-mortem and their brains were analyzed. And, and this is work done in Rome. Uh, Francesca Loisi's group found that in both patients, the one from France and one from Canada, that in the brains of these people that sadly died from uh, rebound, there was e evidence of Epstein-Barr virus lytic infection. In other words, the virus had come out of its dormant phase, its latent phase, and was lytic. And the immune system had found this virus and was attacking it. And as a consequence of this, there was what, what we would call uh, bystander damage uh, to myelin and axons in the, in the vicinity. And so what this is implying is that rebound activity or focal MRI activity may be Epstein-Barr virus induced. Isn't that interesting? Now, I do think this needs to be reproduced. This, this is just two patients. Um, you know, we need mo a lot more evidence, but this is really a, a, an interesting phenomenon. And that if this is the case, then we have to target EBV. And this is one of the theories that I've been putting forward is maybe we should be using EBV antivirals to prevent this rebound as a test case of is EBV driving uh, MS disease activity. Now, what is um, really, really interesting is that rituximab and anti-CD20 that actually depletes B cells and memory B cells is the most effective therapy okay, at preventing natalizumab rebound. This is uh, data from uh, Sweden, and I've highlighted in red there the line that the rebound is almost completely suppressed when you treat these people who are coming off natalizumab with rituximab uh, and it prevents rebound. This is implying that the B cell is important for rebound because rituximab doesn't deplete to any significant degree uh, T cells. It's not only rituximab, other anti-CD20s also do this, ocaluzumab or ofatumab would also certainly do. But I think the message I wanna get to you is that using a selective anti-B cell agent, you can prevent the rebound. And so this is saying that maybe those cells are bringing in the Epstein-Barr virus that causes the rebound. Now, this is work that we did many years ago, um, and this is based on a index case. So a colleague of mine, Professor Julian Gold, who lives in uh, uh, <clears throat> Sydney, and he's an HIV clinician, looks after people who have got HIV and AIDS. And he had a, an index patient who had quite bad MS and was referred to him because he had become HIV positive. Uh, and Julian, Professor Gold, put this patient on antiretrovirals and the patient's MS disappeared. In other words, it became a quiescent. And while this patient, and the pa as far as I'm concerned, this patient is still alive and well on antiretrovirals and their MS has disappeared. And so this was a case report we put out. And then there were a flurry of other case reports very of, of, of a very similar finding. People who had MS went on to 
HIV drugs, you know, highly active antiretrovirals, and their MS went into remission. Now, those are just anecdotal case reports, and it may be what we would call ascertainment bias or publication bias. Only the cases that are positive get into the literature. Anyway, then we went, well, how can we explore this further? So we actually asked an epidemiologist in Oxford uh, to look at the uh, NHS data on hospital statistics in the UK or in the England to see if uh, HIV had any impact on MS. And at the same time, the Danes were doing this, and the Danes got to, got pub, got published before we did, and they showed that uh, people with HIV are much less likely to get MS, and we showed the same thing. We showed that um, the people who are HIV positive have about a 50 to 60 percent lower risk of getting multiple sclerosis, and we think that this is not due to the infection causing immune suppression because these people are on antiretrovirals now. Uh, we, we don't leave people HIV positive without suppressing the virus, so they're not immunosuppressed. We think it's the drugs that have been used for treating or preventing uh, AIDS, so this will be the antiretrovirals. We've actually asked other groups, and just to say to you, in the United States, we asked the people who run a big health maintenance organization in California, Kaiser, to uh, look at their data and also the Veterans Administration, and they showed similar results. Those are unpublished. And I'm also aware that the Canadians and the Swedes have found exactly the same thing, and their data will be published in, in, uh, shortly. They're going to be presented at a meeting in America in a few months' time. So I think this is a real finding. People who are on antiretrovirals have a lower risk of getting MS, and that's probably due to the fact that the antiretrovirals are doing something that prevents MS. And there has been additional work showing that some of the components of the antiretrovirals are actually effective against Epstein-Barr virus. So there's one particular drug called Tenofovir, which is in most, in quite a few of the uh, antiretrovirals, it is against, works against Epstein-Barr virus. So isn't this interesting? Isn't this fascinating? And this is another reason why we need to test highly active antiretrovirals as a treatment option for MS. So when people ask me what the future of MS treatment, I think there's going to be a black swan event and we're going to start targeting uh, Epstein-Barr virus, and either with antiretrovirals, either with specific EBV drugs, or maybe even immunotherapy. These are th ways to boost our own immune system to, ta to tackle the virus. And I would say, based on my predictions, I give the strategy about a 70 to 75% chance of uh, working but we need to do the trials and this is where I need you as a community to help me uh, lobby uh, or you know the MS societies the funders uh, that they really should take the Epstein-Barr virus MS hypothesis more seriously <clears throat> I also wanted to point out that um, a new class of drug has come out is has been tested in MS it's called the brutine tyrosine kinase or BTK inhibitors and this is a really important molecule for uh, activating and, and keeping B cells alive. And very, very interestingly, in the EBV, uh, in its latent phase, produces a protein called latent membrane protein 2. And there's 2A and 2B, and this sits in the membrane. But what's interesting is this protein actually signals via BTK, and it requires BTK to keep the B cell alive. And so if you inhibit BTK, you're actually working against Epstein-Barr virus because those cells will lose their signal that keeps them alive and they shh and they die. And there's pretty good evidence now from experiments done in the lab on cells that brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors, BTK inhibitors, are pan and TBV. So I think it's quite exciting that the BTK inhibitors are being tested in multiple sclerosis, and I think we shouldn't just assume that they're working via B cell biology, but they may be actually working as antivirals. Isn't that interesting? What about therapeutic strategies? So I think this concept of early intervention impacting on long-term prognosis rather than waiting to start disease-modifying therapy is now pretty much accepted by the wider MS community. And so we produced that MS Brain Health document in 2015 to try and uh, promote and uh, get people to accept this treatment strategy. And I think we've got there. It's almost impossible now to justify not treating MS early. I think the next challenge is actually flipping the pyramid, is actually being, being in the position to offer people with multiple sclerosis 
rather than low efficacy or moderate efficacy therapies, the option of going on to high efficacy DMTs. And I think the data is now overwhelming that on average, if you get high efficacy therapies early, you do better than we're having to wait for them. And so the next challenge, and I call this the brain health uh, policy document two challenge, is to get people to accept flipping the pyramid. I'm not saying we should put a gun against everybody who's got MS and say you have to have a high efficacy treatment first line. I think we just have to give them the option of that. In other words, explain to them what MS is, what's its prognosis, and what's the best chance of them doing well in the long term in terms of preventing disability. And, uh, you know, you know, any th person who's in a rational position and understands the field is likely to choose a high efficacy therapy. Uh, or they may choose a low efficacy therapy with the understanding that if they didn't respond to it quite quickly, they would escalate quite rapidly. But it's all about changing the paradigm. <clears throat> so this is going to happen, and I think it's happening already. We're beginning to see a wide uptake in most well, in a lot of countries and MS centers of the flipping the pyramid strategy. And at our center at, uh, at the Royal London Hospital, we're actually taking this to another level. We've got this trial that's just open for recruitment called the ATTACK MS trial. And we want to get people onto a high efficacy therapy and we chose natalizumab just because it's the one drug that works the quickest. And the idea is to get somebody who presents with their first attack, could be optic neuritis, brainstem, or a spinal cord syndrome, and get them onto natalizumab within 14 days. Uh, and then compare that to what we would call standard of care, where it takes much longer to go through the diagnostic pathway and, to, and start them, uh, the other group, on the therapy uh, at week 12. So what we're seeing, what we'll see here is rapid access, like an emergency, versus delayed access at three months. And we think that that 10 to 12 week window may be important because there's no doubt when somebody presents with their first attack, their MS is active and they've got lesions coming and going, and we think they may have consequences. So the idea is to look at biomarkers uh, to see if people who have delayed access and we're not talking about a significant delay we, in in the current thinking, in the current paradigm. Um, we're talking about a 10 to 12 week delay. That's it. And I think we should probably start thinking about what happens if this trial is positive. If this trial is positive and shows that people who get very rapid access to a high efficacy therapy do better than people with delayed access, um, it means that we're going to have to start treating MS like we treat stroke as an emergency. And this will really uh, change the treatment paradigm and make us much, much more aggressive in managing multiple sclerosis. Anyway, let's see what happens. We've, um, we're pretty confident that um, uh, at a biomarker level, we think earlier access to high efficacy treatment will be beneficial. Just to say to you, we've got two strategies at the moment. So this will be the maintenance therapy where we give the drugs continuously. Uh, and we have the so-called immune reconstitution therapy where we just give pulse therapy, maybe two courses in year one and year two, and we don't give any other treatment. And the drugs in the immune reconstitution ones are myloxanthrone, alemtuzumab, cladribine, and uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant. And the maintenance therapies are all the current drugs you know about. Now, in the green boxes here, I have two strategies that I think will emerge in the future. One of them is induction maintenance, where we actually use a very effective therapy, say HACT or alemtuzumab, and we induce a remission, and then we actually put them onto, put people onto long-term maintenance therapy with potentially a safer drug. Um, and I think induction therapy makes a lot of sense. It's used in oncology, it's used in lots of other diseases. And the other one is obviously combination therapy. Clearly we're not getting on top of MS with just anti-inflammatory therapies, then maybe we have to combine them with say remyelination agents, neuroprotective agents. And so I think the future of MS therapy is gonna be induction maintenance and combination. The problem we have at the moment is trial design. We've got lots of compounds and lots of strategies to test these. But how do we actually get this through the uh, clinical trials, uh, get clinically meaningful results, and get the regulators to accept this? And this is where the challenge is, because the current power calculations, how many people you need in these trials, are so large 
and the trials have to be so long that it's virtually impossible uh, to expect the pharmaceutical industry to put so much money into these trials. So I think we're going to have to uh, think creatively how we um, uh, test uh, and get meaningful results with these two strategies. Saying that, though, I don't think the problem is insurmountable. I do think we'll be able to do it uh, long term. Just to say, we've also n now noticed that people with multiple sclerosis who are on high efficacy therapies and are rendered free of relapses and MRI activity, in other words, their disease is under control, they are what we call NIDA, no evident inflammatory disease activity, a significant number will still continue to get worse. And this is just a post hoc analysis of the uh, long term nalizumab or Tysabri observational program in Europe just showing you that about 40% of people would go on to have worsening of their disability despite being free of relapses and MRI activity. In the so, so this is now a term PIRA, progression independent of relapse activity. And this is now a big problem. Uh, we're now beginning to see this almost every single disease modifying treatment we have. They, we, need, uh, we have need to go beyond this. One of the things I did highlight to the community last week is that I think we've been barking up the wrong tree. Uh, and this is, just shows you the results of the 15-year follow-up of the pivotal Avonex interferon beta IM trial. And what was interesting in that study is that people who were on interferon and had relapses or new lesions on their scan, or gadolinium-enhancing lesions on their scan, were much more likely to end up in the worst prognostic group at 15 years than people who didn't. So if you're on a disease-modifying treatment, disease activity tell, is telling you that the drug is failing you, in other words, it's not impacting on MS. Now, what is really, really interesting in this trial is that in the placebo arm, in people who were not on any treatment, on dummy drug, okay, the activity, be it relapses or MRI activity, had no predictor of outcome. And so we got this disconnect between what happens on a treatment versus natural history or placebo. And this must be telling us that uh, uh, MS is uh, not relapses, MRI, MRI activity. And the reason why I say this is this um, beautiful paper from 1989 by Apprentice. He was a statistician. And he put forward a series of criteria for a surrogate endpoint for something that represents the disease. And if you apply Apprentice criteria, um, you will realize that relapses and MRI activity cannot be a surrogate endpoint. And that also tells you it cannot be MS. So my interpretation of this data is that MS is something else and the superimposed inflammation that manifests as relapses or MRI activity is the immune response to what's causing the disease. It is not the disease itself. I hope that makes sense to you. So we have to be targeting something else. And I think that something else is probably in the brain and spinal cord of people with MS. And our inflammation is, our immune system is finding it, but that's not what's causing MS, it's what's in the tissue. And this is not the only observation, so this is just data from MS Base, which is the big international database run out of Melbourne and Australia showing the same thing, that if you're on treatment and have a relapse, it predicts a poor outcome. But if you're off treatment and you have a relapse, it doesn't predict the outcome. Uh, again, failing Prentice criteria telling us that there's something else that's causing MS and it's not the relapses. This particular point is often ignored by people and I'm as guilty as anybody else because um, Professor George Ebers, who's now retired, he's a neurologist from London, Ontario in Canada, had been making this point in the 1990s. He was saying to all of us that outside the first year or two, relapses are not predictive of outcome and or similarly MRI outside the first two to five years doesn't predict outcome and we ignored him uh, and I think you know I've rediscovered this from uh, analyzing data myself and I think he was right uh, and I think we have to take this seriously is that we're missing what MS is. I'm not saying that relapses and MRI activity don't cause damage they do because they cause inflammation Okay, but getting rid of them does not necessarily mean we get on top of MS. And I think this is the curve ball and the blinkers we put on ourselves in thinking of MS as being a clinical radiological uh, condition based on relapses and MRI activity. We have to go beyond that. 
Another disconnect is just showing you in clinical trials. And I've just put up one trial here, which uh, an anti-CD20 of tumumab was compared to teriflunamide, that drug I mentioned to you that uh, has an impact uh, beyond relapses and MRI activity. And there is no doubt that anti-CD20 therapy are superior to teriflunamide. You know, compared to teriflunamide, of a tumor man reduced relapse rates by over 50%. And when it came to MRI activity, they suppressed MRI activity, uh, be, um, you know, be it new lesions or gait enhancing lesions by 98% in the one study and 94% in the other study. And so if you just looked at the relapses and MRI activity, you'd say, goodness me, ofatumumab is far superior to teriflunamide. Be careful. When you look at disability progression, the impact was modest. So there was a slightly different rate. Ofatumumab did have a significant uh, impact on disability progression relative to teriflunamide, but the difference was small. It was, you know, in, in the lower 30s. Uh, so what this is telling us is that I suspect this disability progression is related to some of the damage that's caused by relapses and MRI activity. But when it came to the end organ brain volume loss, and as you know, people with multiple sclerosis, their brains are shrinking between two and seven times more rapidly than people without MS, and that actually integrates the damage. There was no difference. When you look at the rebaselining and you look at year two, the curves are parallel. If, if anything, the curves are better for, for, for teriflunamide than ofatumumab. So this is saying that despite anti-CD20 therapy being far superior to teriflunamide in suppressing focal inflammatory activity, when it comes to the end organ, which predicts poor outcome, etc., it's no different. So this is a disconnect between those two, and this is telling us there's something else going on. <clears throat> I also mentioned that we are exploring even higher doses of ocaluzumab in MS, and this is based on the observation in the pivotal trials that based on your body size, you get a different dose of ocaluzumab. So let's give you an example. If you weigh 120 kilograms and you're quite large and you get 600 milligrams every six months, you're basically getting five milligrams per kilogram every six months. If you're half that size and you weigh 60 kilograms, you're getting 10 milligrams per kilogram. So you're getting double the dose. And we know that those doses make a difference because when you look at the amount of B-cell depletion and you look at the, the levels of the drug in the body, there are difference. And what we did was we divided up those uh, populations into quartiles, into groups of four based on how much depletion they had in terms of the dose. And when we actually analyzed it, there was no difference, uh, no difference in terms of relapses and MRI activity. And most people have interpreted this as, oh, you don't need the big dose, you can get all, you get 10 milligrams per kilogram, you can get away with five. And a lot of neurologists all over the world now are delaying ocaluzumab infusions, giving it every nine, 12, even 18 months based on this data. However, when you actually look at the impact uh, across those different doses based on body size on disability progression, there was a clear ladder. Those who had the highest levels did better in terms of disability progression. And that wasn't only seen in the relapsing population, but was also seen in the primary progressive population. And because of this, we think the bigger doses are better for you in terms of disability progression. And we think we may need the drug to go into the central nervous system to target the B cells in the central nervous system. And that's why we're doing a trial or two trials, one in relapsing, the other one in primary progressive disease, looking at higher doses. So we've got the standard dose 600 versus 1200 versus 1800 based on body size. And I would not be surprised if people do better on higher dose ocrelizumab. And I think it's because the more antibody you give, the more you get into the brain and spinal cord. Antibodies do get into the brain and spinal cord in small amounts, implying that we may have to target the B cells within the brain. I put this up as an example. I've been trying to get this funded now. I see this particular version I put out in 2019, so four years ago, of an induction maintenance. And the idea would be to uh, not leave people on an anti-CD20 indefinitely, but de-risk them uh, onto a drug like teriflunamide and then allow B cells to come back in the presence of an antiviral. The reason why I chose teriflunamide in this trial design is because it works against Epstein-Barr virus. So you can imagine you on ocaluzumab, you go on it for you know three or four infusions or even longer. You then stop it, you start teriflunamide and the B cells come back. But because this is anti-EBV, the B cells that come back won't be reinfected with Epstein-Barr virus. In other words, it tries to cull or prevent re reinfection. 
and the idea would be to compare that to continuous oculizumab. Uh, the theory being you don't need uh, oculizumab uh, long term. I call this the artery study. Um, again, difficult to do, and despite me selling this trial or talking about this trial, not possible to get funding uh, at the moment. So this is just a therapeutic pyramid, uh, and just to say in the past we were comfortable as neurologists just reducing the number of relapses or the severity of relapses. We're not happy with that anymore. We now want to render people free of activity. So we want to have no relapses and no MRI activity. But I've just made the argument that we have to go beyond focal inflammatory activity and target end organ damage. In other words, how do we normalize brain volume loss? And how do we suppress or change other biomarkers? And this may be, for example, flattening the neurofilament levels. As you know, neurofilaments go up in response to damage of nerve fibers uh, and nerve no bodies. Uh, and maybe we have to also go into the central nervous system and scrub the brain clean of the B and plasma cells that make the oligoclonal immunoglobulin bands. And that's uh, input. And in addition to this, we need to treat MS uh, uh, holistically and try and develop add on therapies, combination therapies to, to promote uh, remyelination, protection of damaged axons, restore function, okay, uh, and also target brain health. So this is the future, okay. I did mention that smoldering MS is this process that's driving the brain volume loss despite being free of relapse and MRI activity. And we have a whole lot of potential uh, mechanisms of how this is happening. One is persistent demyelination. The other one is innate immune activation, the so-called hot microglia. The other one is intrathecal or CNS B and plasma cells are making immunoglobulins. Other ones excess iron, other ones energy deficits. This is uh, due to toxicity from oxidative stress to mitochondria, the little energy factories in cells that are not working properly. And also the demyelination requires more energy to transmit a, a signal down an axon. So there's a lot of therapeutic targets uh, that we need to uh, apply drugs to in addition to anti-inflammatory therapies in MS. And then there's also the alternative hypothesis of viruses. Now, if, EBV is due, if MS is due to EBV infection or even activation of endogenous retroviruses that can happen, then we need to actually use antivirals uh, to target small ring MS. So I don't think we have a lack of therapeutic targets and a lack of drugs that need to be tested in small ring MS. And this is just a hint that we may have to go after those BM plasma cells in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis. So this is a study done in Poland, Lublin. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Conrad Regdak, did this. So in Poland, they used to treat people with multiple sclerosis with intravenous cladribine. We now use tablets, but they used to give the drug intravenously. And he called back a group of people that had cladribine more than 10 years ago, and he got them to do, got them to agree to lumbar punctures. And he found that about half of the people had lost the oligoclonal bands after having cladribine. Now that makes sense because cladribine is a CNS penetrant drug and it goes into the brain at a level that I think are sufficient to uh, kill B cells. But what was really important is those people that had lost the oligoclonal bands did better. They had less disease progression, did less disability than those that didn't. And so this is a real strong hint that we really do need to test drugs that actually target central nervous system B cells and plasma cells. And we produced this uh, review article in 2019 uh, Professor Baker and our group just saying that there's quite a lot of therapeutic strategies for doing this. Um, uh, and so we are using, we are doing a trial of cladribine in advanced MS. It's called the Chariot uh, MS trial, looking at this exact question. BTK inhibitors are really interesting because they do get into the central nervous system and I think they may have a CNS effect, which is important. And we're doing a trial called uh, Sizomus, where we're actually using a drug that's licensed for myeloma. It's a proteasome inhibitor called exosomid. And this is CNS penetrant to try and kill plasma cells. Uh, and we're also trying to get uh, a CD19 targeted CAR T cell. This is an engineered cell that would target B cells within the brain uh, and hopefully clear the central nervous system of infected um, or, uh, or, or B cells. So there are quite a lot of strategies and the other ones as well. Um, this is just an example um, of new therapeutics, uh, and I suspect this will, these will uh, emerge uh, as realistic treatments in the future. So it's an exciting time in terms of 
uh, new hypotheses and new treatments that I suspect will get through the pipeline and will be treating MS in the future. I just wanted to point out that ivibrutinib, which is ahead in the race, it's the first uh, BDK inhibitor into phase three. And there's some recent uh, data that was done on uh, the phase two uh, program where they looked at these uh, slowly expanding lesions. These are the smoldering lesions in MS. And they showed there was a dose response uh, on these lesions. People on the highest dose of ibrutinib in the phase two trial um, had the uh, smallest increase in the volume of the slowly expanding lesion. Um, and this is not surprising because those lesions are expanding because the microglia, the innate immunity is active. And this particular drug, ivibrutinib, not only targets B cells, but also targets microglia and macrophages. And by down-regulating them, you may actually impact on the lesion. So this is exciting and a hint that these drugs are working within the central nervous system. Now, this is not MS. This is a condition called systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. Uh, and this is a remarkable article that came out late last year in Nature Medicine where they had people with refractory lupus. These people were really, really ill. They'd been through all the uh, treatments that we normally use. And they were given a uh, engineered T cell. What happens is you take T cells out of the body, you engineer them so that they become uh, 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 responsive to a particular protein called CD19 that's expressed on B cells. You give them back these engineered T cells and they go all over the body and kill B cells because uh, CD19 expressed by B cells and plasma, some plasma blasts. And we know that this drug worked. It, uh, and the remarkable thing is that these patients went into remission and they even lost antibodies. There's a thing in lupus where you get an antibody against what we call double-stranded DNA and they lost that biomarker. And the question you've got to ask, goodness me, are these patients cured from this or not? And the good thing about T cells is there's no barrier. They go into all tissues. And so we're really keen in the UK to try and take this uh, anti-CD19 CAR T cell strategy uh, forward. You know, it's very exciting. <clears throat> Another thing that uh, we would like to go forward, uh, and I predict this will happen, is actually add on your protection. And we did a trial of a drug called Finitone. It's an anticonvulsant. And we got people with acute optic neuritis that lost their vision and we uh, randomized them to three months of phenytone and we chose phenytone it's a really old sodium channel blocker because you can load up and get the doses therapeutic with literally within a, a few hours uh, and what we showed uh, at the end of the uh, at six months that we had reduced the retinal nerve fiber loss the loss of nerve fibers by 30 percent and so this was a real proof of concept trial that uh, acute neuroprotection with an anticonvulsant, a sodium channel blocker, works. Now, we've had problems getting this strategy taken forward, um, but we'll continue to work on it. Uh, and this means that people with multiple sclerosis should probably be on a neuroprotectin drug uh, to help protect axons during inflammatory events from dying off in the future. Remyelination has been disappointing. Uh, we've had some really high-profile failures over the last uh, four or five years. High-dose biotin was meant to work uh, by promoting remyelination and also helping uh, mitochondrial function. You know, there was improving energy consumption. Uh, Bexorotene uh, also failed. Um, we think that may have failed because of trial design. And when you look at the data, it looks like younger patients did benefit. Uh, and then the two antibodies, opisunumab and elizunumab, both of these bind to inhibitors of remyelination also fail. Now, I don't think the biology is wrong. I mean, when you look at the biology of these compounds in cell culture, in animal models, they work. There's no doubt they work. I think our mistake is we haven't included in our remyelination neurostorative trials uh, active add-on rehabilitation or exercise. And the, the, the reason I say this is the mechanisms that drive recovery of function, and this is remodeling of axons, sprouting of axons to create new connections, synaptogenesis, the actual synapses between uh, axons and nerve cell bodies, and then obviously the plasticity mechanisms that the brain uses to recover function. All of these require a physiological stimulus, and the best stimulus is rehabilitation or exercise, and we haven't added into our trials 
rehab or we just rely on spontaneous recovery of function i think this is the mistake we're making if you're speaking to a person working in stroke medicine or somebody working in spinal cord injury they would never ever design a trial without having rehabilitation embedded into it and i think we're going to have to go back to the drawing board and reassess whether these dr uh, drug trials fail because of biology or trial design and i think it's trial design and I think every single remyelination near restoration trial should include targeted rehabilitation to try and create the signal for recovery of function. Um, some of my colleagues disagree with me. They think this will happen spontaneously. I don't. Why would you? I mean, it's like somebody who has a relapse and they don't use that hand. That relapse, that hand's not going to recover. They have to do rehab to, uh, to train that hand to recover. And obviously, if you're on a drug that makes that recovery uh, quicker and better, then you're going to see the difference between placebo and active treatment because the drug, in combination with rehabilitation, will result in improvement in function. And then the other thing I said to them in the future is we're missing a trick. We've got to just stop thinking uh, with our blinkers about MS, but also think about what I call the non-MS targets, the brain health targets. And I've written and spoken on MS selfie about this endlessly. You know, we've got to promote brain health. And this is the kind of messages we're trying to get across to the general population. You know, you should not smoke. You should drink alcohol in moderation, exercise. And I personally think hits better than aerobic. Obviously, make sure your diet is good. And there are some um, diets that are better than others in terms of promoting uh, brain health. Sleep hygiene. We know that people who don't sleep very well do worse. Comorbidities infections we've got to stop all these or try and prevent these concomitant medications we know anticholinergics are not good for the brain we should probably try and optimize people's medications get off anticholinergics anti-aging medications hrt metformin has been used now or tested as anti-aging and we should watch the space maybe in the future everybody with ms will need to be on metformin and then social determinants of health this is really important so we now know particularly during covid that people with poor social determinants of health did badly. Uh, yeah. And in MS, we know it's a big problem. People are socially isolated. Uh, they are lonely. And we know loneliness kills. And you know, we shouldn't just accept this. There are things we could do to promote social determinants. In other words, improve people's ability to get out, connect, etc. And obviously, wellness is just more than health. Uh, it's focusing on other things, how you interact with the environment, spirituality, Etc. So there's a lot that can be done in terms of non-MS targets. Uh, and I uh, uh, always talk about marginal gains. You know, if you improve a lot of things with, by small amounts, they all add up and, and result in a much better outcome. So, the, you know, the future of MS is not just about treating MS, but also about promoting brain health. And I put this up as just an example. This is a small study published two years ago from Germany comparing moderate continuous training versus high-intensity interval training or HIT. And looking at just the red box here, this is neurofilament levels. You can see people who went on to HIT had much lower, a much greater reduction in the neurofilament levels than people who had moderate continuous training. And there's other data outside of MS showing you that HIT is better than uh, aerobic continuous training. Now, HIT is hard. Um, you've got to get onto a bicycle or treadmill or do it, whatever you can do. And you've got to get your heart rate up to above 90%, you know, probably for several minutes in a 15 minute cycle. And uh, it's tough, it's painful. Whereas moderate continuous training, your heart rate is really between 60 to 80% of your predicted maximum. And uh, there is little doubt that when you look at peripheral biomarkers, hits better than. Uh, moderate continuous training and I suspect this will pan out in MS as well uh, we want to do a trial on of, of this to see what the biology is on the central nervous system but um, uh, and don't feel you can't do it even people in wheelchairs can do hit using uh, you know, upper limb exercise so if you are going to choose an exercise strategy I would uh, suggest you look into it Another thing that's come out is, uh, and this is work by Robin Franklin's group in Cambridge, is that people who are older um, don't remodelate or recover function very well. In other words, their cells become senescent or age. 
uh, and that you can actually rejuvenate those cells and make them young again by uh, actually adding on metformin or fasting these these people. Um, I think why this happens is that there's this particular uh, biological pathway called NRF2, which is a programmed cell survival pathway. And there are lots of things that activate NRF2. It's not only caloric restriction. We know intermittent fasting and ketogenic diets do it. Some nutraceuticals can do it as well. Uh, and drugs like metformin. And I put here fumarates um, because fumarates actually bind to a receptor that activates uh, NRF2. And exercise has also been shown to do it. So there are a, lot, a large number of things that can be done to hopefully rejuvenate remyelination recovery functions. And it's not just metformin or fasting, lots of things that can be done. And I won't go through these pathways in detail, but all I want to uh, point out that there are well-defined metabolic uh, and biological pathways of how these different strategies work. And this is not unique to MS. This is probably a principle for uh, other neurodegenerative diseases as well. And I want to point out that when you do go on to prolonged fasting or you go on to ketogenic diets, your body changes its metabolism and it produces these things called ketone bodies. And one of the ketone bodies uh, called beta-hydroxybutyrate, which goes up highest, is actually a bioactive compound. It binds to a receptor on cells, uh, which is exactly the same receptor that um, fumarate binds to. And it activates NRF2. So I actually think ketogenic diets or or anything that puts up your ketones, be it fasting or caloric restriction, uh, is activating NRF2, and this is promoting rejuvenation uh, and anti-aging mechanisms and recovery of function. So this is possibly why people are, f uh, and there are some early reports of people doing well uh, when they do dietary manipulation to put up ketones. And there was a hint, so I was actually on the steering committee, so this is a conflict of interest, but we now we know the affinity uh, trial of oposunumab, which is a, a monoclonal antibody that blocks uh, a drug called Lingo, which is an inhibitor of remyelination. Um, when we did the trial, the trial was sadly negative, um, but this was an add-on trial. So this is one of the future strategies where you have a baseline anti-inflammatory and you add on treatments on top. Uh, and the trial allowed people to be on interferon beta, dimethyl fumarate, or natalizumab. But you can see when in the di in the dimethyl fumarate group that it looks like the people did better with oposunumab. In other words, there is a gap between the placebo and the active treatment arms, where there is no gap with interferon beta and natalizumab. And the reason why I highlight this is dimethyl fumarate, okay, okay increases NRF2, which may promote recovery of function. So I don't think we should ignore this. This is just a signal uh, in the trial. Uh, and maybe in the future, dimethyl fumarate may be the, well, the fumarates may be the drugs of choice to add on a remyelination therapy strategies. Anyway, what's happening uh, in the UK is instead of DMF, they're going to be using metformin, which also increases that survival factor as a base to add on a, a pro-remyelinating agent, and the, the drug is clomastine uh, in the Cambridge uh, Edinburgh trial. Another trick is comorbidity. So this is actually data from Canada, just showing you that if you have MS and you have any vascular comorbidity, be it smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, dyslipidemia, or even blockage of arteries, peripheral vascular disease, or cardiovascular disease, um, you get to using a walking stick about six years earlier than people without vascular comorbidities. And there's no doubt vascular disease is bad for the brain. And I suspect what's happening here, this is reducing reserve. Uh, and this treatment gap, okay, this uh, disability gap of six years is enormous. This is bigger than the treatment effect of interference, for example. So we're missing a trick by not managing MS holistically. We should be aggressively screening uh, treating or even preventing people from getting vascular comorbidities. So this is population health, essentially. Okay, and this may be why the drug simvastatin, simvastatin is the first statin that came out. This is a drug to lower cholesterol levels. And Jeremy Chataway, a colleague of mine from Queen Square in in London, did this phase two trial showing you that hydrosimvastatin, that's 80 milligrams. Okay, people who took it with second progressive disease had reduced brain volume loss uh, in the first and second year and across the whole two years. And because of this, there's now a phase three trial called MSTAT2 uh, running uh, with the 
uh, idea of uh, uh, trying to confirm this, and if it does confirm, I see people with progressive disease or more advanced disease going on to a statin in addition to an anti-inflammatory therapy. So this is the future. And I just want to say that uh, we have to, as an MS community, manage MS holistically. You know, a lot of us are siloed. We just look after disease-modifying therapies, and we don't think beyond that. And I think if we want to make a difference to people with multiple sclerosis, we have to look at them holistically. And that means developing our services. You know, our services are not ideally suited for infection prevention. We're not screening and managing sleep problems uh, aggressively enough. We are prescribing anticholinergics rather than getting rid of anticholinergics. You know, we need to promote HRT in women who are going into the menopause. Uh, we need to have programs to address social determinants of health. If we've got a patient who's lonely, we need to stick them into a social prescribing program where they may get a, a link worker helping them uh, do community-based projects, be it gardening, art classes, book clubs, etc. And it's not those activities necessarily, but it's meeting other people. You know, the brain is a social brain and we need interactions. So there are lots of things we can do uh, beyond just treating MS with disease-modifying therapies. To pre 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 And I think this is, uh, it may not be exciting, it may sound very boring, but you speak to anybody with multiple sclerosis or speak to anybody who runs MS uh, services, we just don't have the resources in the NHS to do this at S scale. You know, we're so overworked with just managing disease-modifying treatments, managing diagnosis and symptomatic problems. You know, trying to manage brain health is a, 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 a task. And we're going to have to be innovative how we do this. And this is one of the reasons why I started MS Selfie, is MS Selfie for MS Self Management, is to try and promote this concept of um, brain health. So in conclusion then, I think uh, new data and insights, particularly around Epstein-Barr virus, are really challenging our, what I call MS dogma. Uh, MS is likely the cause of MS and it may be driving MS disease activity and this has implications for MS prevention and for treatment. You really should be uh, rushing forward with trials of EBV antivirals and EBV immunotherapy. And I hope you as an MS community volunteer for these trials if we get them off the ground. I think the real MS is not relapses or focal MRI activity, but rather smoldering MS, uh, and that inflammation is in response to what's causing the disease, and I suspect it's EBV. And we need to really treat M uh, MS beyond no evident inflammatory disease activity. We have to try and normalize end organ damage, stop people getting brain volume loss. And we have a lot of pathological drivers, and I won't repeat these, but we've got large numbers of therapeutic targets and drugs to test. And because of that, we're going to have to uh, change our uh, trial design and have to get the regulators and everybody on board so that we can develop these treatments. And uh, I think we'll be moving into an era where we'll be doing induction maintenance um, as a therapeutic strategy, not only to de-risk long chronic immunosuppression, but also to address some of the principles that I've highlighted above. And we're clearly going to have to go to combination therapies. We we now know that we can't just manage MS with anti-inflammatories. We have to add on other drugs. And just to reiterate, we're going to have to develop uh, strategies uh, to change our health service delivery so we manage MS holistically. And then one of the biggest problems I think that needs to be tackled continuously is the foster adoption of therapeutic strategies. We still have pockets of neurologists, pockets in different countries where adopting early uh, and more effective therapies first line are slow. Uh, and that's what we call the slow adoption of innovations. Uh, some people call it therapy, therapeutic inertia. Anyway, we as an MS community need to educate, 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 keep pushing and creating tools uh, to drive uh, early adoption of innovations with therapeutic strategies. Otherwise, people with MS are going to be left uh, to smolder away and not be managed more proactively. So I'll stop there to take questions. The questions will have to be written so you can uh, ask questions and I'll respond to them. And let me know if you uh, like this format. And then I'd also like to just encourage you to please, if you can afford to uh, subscribe, please become a paying subscriber. Um, I really do um, need to make this MSL uh, self-sustaining in terms of its future.